Merhabalar herkese, IFT Talk seminerlerine hoş geldiniz. Bugün Birleşik Krallık'ta eğitim düşünenler için Northern Bray Üniversitesi'den Lina bizlerle olacak. Lütfen sorularınızı sağ alt köşede questions bölümünden yönlendirmeyi unutmayın. Yes Lina, the stage is yours now. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Lina and I'm the International Recruitment Officer here at Northumbria University. So my role uh, means that I'm here to support um, any European applicants we have, any people from Europe that would like to apply to Northumbria and just to give you more information about all your options. Um, I'm from Lithuania as well, and I moved to the UK to, for, to study for my undergraduate degree. Uh, for me, it was a, an amazing decision. I had one of my best, some of my best years uh, studying in the UK. So I'm excited to be here, help you um, get some more information so that maybe you can make this great decision for yourselves too. So um, I can see someone's typing in a chat already. So hello, hello to everyone. Um, if you have any questions uh, throughout the session, uh, please uh, feel free to put them in the chat. And today uh, we will talk about uh, myths about studying in the UK, uh, most common things you might hear, um, some gossips, you know, and I'll hopefully help you understand if those myths are true or false. That's That will be based on research, also my own experience, uh, you know, talking to students and other such. So I'd like to start with just asking you uh, about what kind of myths about studying in the UK you've heard. Can you, maybe you have any examples? Um, some of the ones we will talk about will be that, you know, it's hard to make friends, that you won't understand the accent, that maybe it's expensive, things like that. But maybe you have any other myths that you've heard about studying in the UK? If you want to answer, you can use the chat. I'll give you a minute or so. If you can't think of anything, that's okay as well. But just, um, I'm giving you a chance to, to share. And I am always curious to know what you've heard as well. Okay, I see some of you are typing. So hello everyone. Um, in case you joined us a little later, we're talking about myths about studying in the UK. And today, hopefully I will give you some clarity whether those myths are true or false. And be before we get begin, I'd love to know um, what kind of myths about studying in the UK you've heard. Uh, maybe they will be the ones I will have included in the presentation, maybe not. So I'm giving you um, just, a little longer in case you're typing still and if not i'll get back to the chat and, and read out the ones you've uh, wrote okay so the first uh, thing i'll do is just explain how we're going to do the session so we're going to talk through the 10 top myths about studying in uk so those include uh the weather so that the weather is terrible the second one is that students all they do is drink. The next one is that the studying in the UK is expensive. Next one is that accommodation is expensive, um, that UK food is not great, then that it's hard to get around the UK. If you want to travel from city to city, then another one I've heard is that it'll be hard to make friends. I think that's one that we all um, worry about. Next one is the accent. You know, is it going to be easy for me to um, to integrate if I don't speak uh, English as a native speaker. Uh, the next one is that about the jobs and uh, that the UK degree holds no value. So these are the things that um, I found, the top myths. So we'll figure out if they're true or not as we go along. And then just before we end, I'll give you a short introduction about Northumbria University where I'm working now and which I represent. And then we'll take your questions if you have any. Okay, so the first one is that the weather is terrible in the UK all the time. So that's probably something that uh, you all worry about. Uh, I found that that's uh, especially the case sometimes in warmer countries. Um, 
So what people say about study about living in the UK is that you can experience all uh, seasons in, in, in one day. <laughs> so it might be uh, even snowing in the morning, then raining, uh, sunny, and, and so on. So I think people sometimes feel that um, you don't really know what to wear or what kind of coat to bring. And that is the, the type of weather we have here in England. I wouldn't say that it's as terrible as we would um, imagine. And when I first, before I moved to England, I was thinking that I need to buy waterproof shoes and coat and five umbrellas and so on. But when I got here, uh, I noticed that it's actually not raining that much at all um, compared to how I imagined. Um, it's not sunny all the time, so you're not going to have as much sun as you do maybe living in some other countries. Um, and it does rain a little bit, but as I said, it doesn't rain as much as I expected. And um, if you want, you can have a look on the website and include it, and you can see the comparison of weather um, in London and in Istanbul. And as you can see, the first chart shows the temperatures. So Istanbul is, um, is warmer, but as you can see, it still follows similar projections. So it's still you will still have a warmer summer and colder, um, colder winter. So there's still going to be seasonal. And if you look at the table next to it, that you can see the number of days on average um, for each month, um, a number of rainy days. And what was surprising to me, maybe you can tell me if it's right or wrong, but that um, in some months it rains uh, in Istanbul more than it does in London. So as you can see, um, in summer, we have uh, less rainy days, no, sorry, more rainy days. But then uh, during the, um, the, the winter, when it's winter in Istanbul, it rains less in, in England. So that's very interesting. <laughs> but, but yes, so it's not going to be super sunny. It doesn't rain as much as you would expect, but it is a f on average colder. Uh, and it changes more quickly than in other places, I think. So that's uh, myth one. If you've been living in England, let me know if you think it's right or wrong. Let me know your thoughts. Okay, so the second uh, thing, uh, the second myth um, I hear a lot and that maybe you've heard of as well, that all students do is drink um, and they don't do anything else. And that when you come here, everyone's just going to be drinking all the time and and, and that's, that's it. So... Um, to put some history behind this, um, you, you might know that UK has a long history of drinking alcohol. Um, and in Victoria, Britain, the pub was the social center of society. So you will see a lot of pubs around and it is part of UK's culture. However, we have noticed that uh, drinking um, amongst students has been declining over time. Um, and of course, there's people to all kinds of people that prefer different things. And you will see that in the university, there's a good, great diversity, people coming from all kinds of countries and all parts of the world. And they will, of course, have all different interests. So, uh, of course, you don't have to drink when you're here. But if you want to, um, it is possible as well. So you'll see this, that we have a lot of different societies. Some of them are cocktail making societies, maybe, or beer appreciation societies, but there's way more other types of societies that do not involve drinking or they're not um, based all around it. So I think the easiest answer to this myth is that it is uh, it is the case among some students if they would like to spend their time like that, but there's definitely a lot of different groups that do not uh, in get involved in these kinds of activities. Okay, so the next myth, um, of course, is about the cost because it is very important to us to consider and it is smart to think about how much it's going to cost before you commit to studying here for a couple of years. So um, what is important to say that the cost of the studies will depend a lot on the university, on the city where the university is based and the program because you'll see that uh, different programs cost uh, differently. So maybe some programs that uh, require a lot of lab times will be a bit more expensive than maybe studying English literature that does not require that much equipment. Also, uh, the north of the UK tends to be um, more, sorry, tends to be cheaper than um, the south of the UK. And of course, London is the most expensive city in the whole country. So if you're studying um, in the north of England, 
it will be a lot cheaper. So um, you will also uh, see that universities offer scholarships. I will talk about that in the next slide. So that can reduce the cost for you. Um, also, the UK degrees are shorter than in other countries. So studying in the UK would only take you three years and postgraduate would be one year long only. So what the, seems maybe as a large amount is only spread through three years. So that could be something that, um, that is important to consider. Of course, another thing is that um, in the UK, there's numerous different student discounts available. So when you become a student, because, you know, uh, start asking everyone, do you have a student um, discount? And you will see that it's available in many, many shops, supermarkets, whatever you buy, you might be able to get 10, 15, 20% discount. And uh, you can compare the cost of living of uh, the, the, from the university that you're interested in studying in the UK to the city you're living in um, at the moment on this link, numbeo.com. If you just type in numbeo.com um, in your browser, you'll be able to compare the cost of living in different cities. And of course, you can get a, a rail car that saves you on your trips. And you have to contact the universities to see what scholarships they offer if you're interested in studying there. Because sometimes it is not that easy to find on their website, so it's best if you contact them to, to find out. So when you consider all of these different things, studying in the UK could even be cheaper than other countries, depending on the course, the city, and the scholarship you can get. And as we're talking about scholarships, um, just to reiterate that they can be very different from university to university because the universities decide on what scholarships they offer. Um, you have to apply for the course first and then you find out what scholarship you can get. That's usually how it happens. And pay attention to how long the scholarship is valid for. Most of the time it might be just for one year. Some universities might offer scholarships for several years. So just look into that. And um, they might be open to international students or they can just be based on your nationality. They can be offered to some courses or they can be given for skills such as sport or music. So please contact the international offices in each university you're interested in and, and they'll be able to advise what scholarships are available to you. And of course, if you are interested in Northumbria, I'll, you can contact me and I'll tell you. Or I can just tell you now that we do have uh, scholarships available for international students. The one we offer is this one. It's an automatic scholarship. It's, uh, it's, it gives you a 3,000 pounds discount to your tuition fees. And it's, it, as long as you're an international student who is not in receipt of any sponsorship, so that means that it's not a company, your employer, or the government paying for your studies. As long as it's not the case, then you will be able to get this uh, discount. And again, very similar scholarship for postgraduate students. This scholarship gives you £2,000 tuition fee discount if you're an international student who's not in receipt of any scholarship. So you see, we do have, we do try to make it cheaper for you. And when we're talking about studying in the UK and studying in Newcastle, where Northumbria University is based, you can see that we are based in one of the most affordable cities in the UK. So studying here uh, could be cheaper than studying in the South or London, of course. And you can see that on average, students spend around 600 pounds per month for living expenses. So that could be a lot cheaper than studying in the Netherlands or Denmark, depending on which city you're in. So that's something that's also important to consider when you're thinking about the costs. Okay, so we spoke about uh, three myths and the fourth one is um, that student accommodation is expensive. So again, that is not necessarily the case depending on what you compare it to. So the prices depend on university's location. So again, um, Northumbria is based in Newcastle and Newcastle is a very affordable city. So that's why our accommodation is cheaper than other universities maybe. So our prices start from 70 pounds per week. So on average, you, would, you, you can spend 300, and 400, uh, 300 or 400 pounds per month for your accommodation. And that includes all the bills. 
so you don't have to pay separately for Wi-Fi, water, electricity, heating, and things like that. It's all included. If you are looking for more affordable options, have a look at the shared flats. So that's where you share your bathroom, you share your um, kitchen and lounge with four to five other students. Uh, if you want something cheaper as well, don't look at studios or end suite. Those are those tend to be a bit more expensive. And we also have self-catered uh, properties. So that means that you're cooking for yourself. So those tend to be cheaper than those that involve food naturally. So accommodation, um, there are some uh, affordable options. There are some more expensive options. It depends on what you're looking for and also depends on which city you're based. Okay, so the next myth um, that is, you know, heard a lot, I think that, you know, that you can hear a lot is that UK uh, food is not the best. <laughs> so if you've heard this one, let me know. Um, I think that's what we think when we come to England that, you know, it's just going to be fish and chips and beans on toast. <laughs> but, you know, surprisingly, it is a very, very diverse country with a diverse cuisine, you can find so many different restaurants here for all different um, nationalities, for all different cuisines. So because UK is such a diverse country with people from all around the world, uh, those people come here, establish their restaurants, and you can have really high quality, great food from all around the world, which is amazing. So at Northumbria, for example, we have a Chinatown. You can see it on the top right uh, photo. So that's where you can have the best um, Chinese uh, Thai food. You can have Korean barbecues, um, sushis, of course, lots of um, stir fries and things like that. There's also Greek restaurants, Italian restaurants. Also, on top of that, you can find the ingredients for these so-called world foods in the rest in the, in the supermarkets as well so uh, it wasn't easy for, it, it wasn't hard for me to find you know local delicacies that are available in lithuania in the uk you will also find some turkish shops and you know there's polish shops uh, lithuanian shops where you can buy foods from home so it's definitely not awful <laughs> uh, maybe you might you might not be the fan of english cuisine but it is so great that you can find so many foods from all around the world um, being offered in England. And of course, some students will not eat that healthy. Maybe you will have housemates that eat beans on toast every day and uh, maybe they enjoy it. Maybe that's a part of their student life. That's OK. And you can um, you can learn how to cook, go through your journey while you're a student as well. Maybe that's part of it. Um, yes, but to also to mention that if you have any dietary requirements, it is England is probably one of the most um, is one of the best cities for for inclusivity in terms of dietary requirements. If you're vegan, vegetarian, if you um, want to eat gluten free or halal, all of those options are available, and there's so many different restaurants that offer that. So it's it's very inclusive in that sense. So I would not say that food is awful in England at all. So I would think that's a false myth. Okay, um, another one is that um, getting around the UK is difficult and expensive. So when I saw this myth, um, I was curious if people actually think that because uh, because I have not noticed that at all. And I think going coming, you know, getting around the UK is actually very simple. There's lots of buses, um, trains. There's, you know, metros, um, underground services um, um, all around England. In some countries they have, uh, sorry, in some cities they have trams as well. So um, it is very easy and convenient to get around, I'd say. And you can see the photo on the middle, uh, sorry, in the middle on the, at the top of the screen that shows all the airports we have in, um, in England. So there's lots of different airports. And in Newcastle, where, where Northumbria University is based, we have Newcastle Air Airport, so it has direct flights to all major, UK, uh, all major European destinations, and you can fly within the UK as well. One thing that is important to mention that trains may be more expensive than in other countries. 
So compared to Lithuania, for example, uh, trains are significantly more expensive in England, but you can get a, a rail car that I mentioned before and save um, one third of your price on trains. So the rail card costs only 30 pounds, but it lasts for a year. And whenever you buy a train ticket, you save a third of the price. So I think that's um, a very important thing to know. <laughs> Go get your rail card when you come to England. And uh, you'll see that in the, in the universities, uh, campuses are usually quite compact. So it is easy to, to walk around. So in Newcastle, for example, I don't use public transport at all because you can walk everywhere. I also have a, I also have a bike, so I don't need to use metro or buses. Um, and then you'll see that in a lot of student cities in the UK. And even if you have to take the bus to get to the university, some universities will give you the, the bus pass for free, so you don't have to pay for, for transportation. And um, in Newcastle, we also have scooters that you can rent. Um, you'll see that it, it is very common in, in Europe as well, uh, of course, you know. And the orange scooter that you see in the photo, that's the one that we have in Newcastle. So if you want, you can use that as well. So I would not say that it's, it's difficult to get around the UK and, and it can be expensive if you don't have a rail card, but you can get a rail card definitely and it's significantly cheaper. Okay, so the next myth um, is I think very relevant to all of us is that it will be hard to make friends. I think that's more of a concern really for, for students than it's, it's an actual, uh, than, than a myth because I think we all worry about that, but universities put so much effort and so much um, um, fac facilitation in making sure you can make friends, that it is not um, that difficult. You'll see that when you join the university, the first week before your study start is called Freshers' Week. So that's the week where you have lots of events, you might have separate international students' events. You will have day trips, um, fairs. You will have uh, parties. You can have um, all kinds of different activities organized. Um, and only the, the first year students are invited. And as I said, you might have international only events. So you might be able to, use, to meet all the international people separately. So all these activities are put in place to help you meet people who are similar to you. Um, you will see also that universities have a really high population of international students. So at Northumbria, for example, <coughs> sorry, at Northumbria, for example, 30% of all students are international. So can you imagine 30% of everyone that studies are feeling very similar to you? They might be worried about making friends. They are excited and eager to go and meet other people because they want to make friends and everyone's going to be feeling the same way so the the circumstances the environment the activities everything is is working towards you finding people you like and bonding with them and also if if you are um, struggling you can join a society so there's lots of different societies at northumbria as you can see here um, you can see here that we have architecture, climbing, dance, dog walking, um, foodie society, if you like food, <laughs> meme society, poker, radio, running, photography. And these are just some of them. So if you have a hobby, you can join the society and you will meet people who are interested in the same thing as you are. So I think um, making friends is not um, impossible and there's all the support available to, to help you uh, to make those friends. Okay, so I'll just quickly have a look at the questions in case they are um, okay. So I will answer your questions after the the presentation, if that's okay. So um, I'll be finished in in fifteen minutes and so, and I will look at your questions then. Thank you, thank you for asking questions. If you have anything else you want to ask. Just, just ask away and I'll answer after the presentation. Okay, so another thing I hear sometimes and another concern um, that students have is that they won't be able to understand the accent or 
they will, you know, it will be hard for them to integrate because they're not native speakers. And I think it is a very understandable concern. You know, it is a bit scary to move to another country. And I definitely felt a bit worried about that. But I think, again, what's important to understand is that there are so many other students who are feeling the same way. And also, um, some of your lecturers will be foreign. They will be from outside of the UK. They will have lived maybe in the UK for many years, but they they will have had that experience of moving abroad to England um, and going through the same experiences that you are. So I think that really makes it a lot easier because the lecturers will be understanding, they will be patient, they will offer you additional support if you need it. And just having that community of international students that are going through the same thing is going to make it easier for you to to feel comfortable. You'll have that safe space of other students who are feeling the same. Um, so it will take a little bit of time. It might be a transition in the first couple of months. But after that, I think you'll see that you got used to it. Maybe you, uh, you know, have a bit of an accent, an English accent now. Um, so I think you'll be, you'll definitely be okay. And if not, just know that universities have such great support system in place. Um, some universities will have English classes incorporated in the course. There will also be um, student support and well-being team that can help you. And you will see that um, universities do have English requirements in place um, to help you know that your English level is at the right level for you to be able to um, to thrive in the in the university environment. And just a tip, if you are nervous, you can listen to podcasts or YouTube videos that, that are given in an English accent. So maybe that will help you familiarize yourself with the new pronunciation and the, the words. And as I said, there are a lot of support available, uh, international student support in particular, that can help you um, get more familiar and comfortable with the environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another thing that people are worried about that is that, that they won't be able to get a job and that there aren't any jobs for international students. But that's not the case. Again, I think that's a false myth. Um, so most universities have employability and career services. So those services help students get a job during their studies or after their studies. Also, universities will have resources and employers who are looking to recruit students, so they are able to get you in contact with them as well. Um, universities will also have jobs on campus. So at Northumbria, for example, we have um, jobs in the marketing department, for example, a digital content creator. So in, as a digital content creator, you would be taking videos or photos or writing articles about your student life, recording your experience as an international student. And you would be paid to, to do that so that uh, the university can share it on their uh, marketing um, platforms. Sorry, social media platforms. You can also be a telecenter caller. So those students uh, call our um, the people who are interested in applying to North Olympia and they answer their questions. So, you know, uh, students enjoy talking with with current students. I mean, if you are interested in applying to Northumbria, you, you might, might be interested in talking to a current student. So that's where the telecenter callers would come in. They would be able to call the student and answer the questions. So that's another job that is available on campus to be that caller. Also, there's uh, jobs available in shops, restaurants, cafes, bars, and so on. So there, are, so there is a support available, you just have to take it. If you take you know, advantage of career workshops, CV workshops, consultations, um, then it's definitely possible to get a job. Okay, um, and just um, sorry, just to reiterate, there is that support available at Northumbria, but I mentioned this, so I will skip the slide. And lastly, 
I think this is an important myth uh, to debunk. Um, so some people think that the UK degree might not be worth it, that maybe it's the same to study in their own country, that it's not worth all the effort and the money to go to the UK. But I think from my own experience, from other students I met experience, and just uh, from the experience of my friends and other people I know that studied in the UK and then went back to work in their own country, I would say that this is definitely false because the UK degree, um, just studying abroad in particular, builds your independence, it gives you confidence, it can teach you English language. You you would be you will be a fluent speaker when you come back, and that's very valuable by employers. It helps you open your mind, as you can see. It helps you communicate with people from other countries. Um, it it helps you build a network of other international students that you know might be useful when you, if you want to go and work um, in their field or in their um, country. And um, most of the UK degrees are accredited so it means that when you study let's say chemistry if the course is accredited by royal society of chemistry it means it's a recognized course it means it is a, a recognized abroad and in the uk and most of the uk degrees are accredited it means that they would be recognized um, abroad and in the country also the uk degrees are highly practical so you will get a lot of experience a lot of opportunities to have industry contact maybe you'll be able to even work for the employers as well and and you can see some more reasons of why studying abroad is appreciated on the left so you can see that um, employers want students who have international experience um, they recognize that as um, a reason to give you a higher salary and it helps you improve your language skills and it was uh, there was a study that noticed that 27 percent of exchange students meet their um, loved one while studying abroad <laughs> so you know um, it might be that you get that kind of value <laughs> from studying abroad on top of having a great valuable degree and to give an example of Northumbria as I said, we do have a lot of practical experience. So we have lots of labs, industry standard labs that are dedicated to building the skills you need to, to be able to get a job that you want. We'll have companies come in to, to work on life projects. For example, if you study fashion at Northumbria, um, we worked with Zara and Endshop. So they were coming to, to talk to the students and give projects for them. And that's something you can put on your CV afterwards. Um, and uh, there's placement opportunities and study abroad opportunities within your degree as well. So placement is where you work and get practical experience you, you, uh, during your studies. So that is usually in well-known companies uh, and it's usually paid as well. So that's a great opportunity for you. And study exchange is studying abroad in another country during your degree. And we have those uh, on offer as well. Okay. So that was it for the myths um, for studying in the UK. We spoke about the cost of living, about making friends, about uh, UK maybe, um, you know, the, the food that's available here, about um, what else was there, about finding a job and the value of the UK degree. So hopefully that helped you um, to, to understand better of what's true and what's not true what to believe and not to believe and hopefully that give you some useful uh, tips. So now just very quickly, I'll just talk about Northumbria University and then I uh, will answer your questions. So I was giving some some examples from Northumbria University, but now I'll, I'll give you a better overview about the university. So we are very international university. So um, 10,000 of our students are international. So that's more than 30% of everyone that studies here. So you will meet people from all around the world. We are the best young university in the UK, uh, from the UK in the world rankings. So we are a young university, but we are doing really well in the rankings. And uh, we really focus on your student life. So we um, offer a lot of sports, societies, lots of study abroad opportunities, and we are based in a 
affordable city that's very safe. So um, I already mentioned that we are an aff in affordable city, um, in a affordable city, but it's also a great student city with lots of uh, activities. Um, there's beautiful castles around, beautiful beaches, only a couple of uh, 20 minutes away from campus. And we are one of the safest cities as well. These are some photos of the region. Um, you can study almost anything at Northumbria. The only subjects we do not offer are pharmacy, dentistry, languages, um, and um, marine biology, marine engineering, so anything to do with the sea. But we offer almost everything else. We have business law, marketing, accounting, uh, biology, chemistry, physics, sci forensic science, sport courses, nursing, coaching, physiology, uh, psychology. Then we also have artistic courses like fashion, art, history, criminology, English literature, graphic design, animation. And then lastly, we have engineering and environment where you can study architecture, mechanical engineering, electronical engineering, civil engineering, computer science, maths, physics, geography. If you're interested in any one of these subjects, just let me know and I can tell you more about it. But something that's um, general about all of these uh, faculties is that there's a lot of practical experience and we, that we have great alumni that can um, attest to the quality of the degrees. So these are some of the facilities we have. So the first one on the left is our architecture studios, then our library, then you can see some of our labs. We do have a swimming pool on campus. So if you are interested in swimming or playing water polo, that's available. Uh, the middle left photo is our computer science building. Then the things that look like microwaves are actually 3D printers. So that's where you can make models for maybe architecture or engineering. The last uh, photo on the right in the top corner, that's our business school. Then our sports center is on the bottom left. So that's where our sports and exercise science or coaching nutrition students do their research or learn in practice. And the bottom right uh, photo is of our fashion, uh, fashion lecture halls. You can see all the sewing machines. And then the first photo here on the left top corner, that's our library. Then in the middle, you have art restoration classes, um, the, the, the facilities there. And the top right, that's the nursing students learning in a practical environment. Then the bottom left corner is, um, is engineering studios. And the, the last two photos are of our library. Okay, so now uh, we'll just talk about entry requirements and then I'll take your questions. So please put your questions in the question box and I will uh, answer right after this slide. So entry requirements, I know uh, you will want to know what you need to, to get into Northumber University. So here it is. So for undergraduate degree, you have to look, so that's the bachelor's degree. You have to look at the top three uh, top three call, um, sorry, <laughs> the, the top of the, the table here. So you can see you need uh, one of them um, to be able to, to apply. And for master's degree, we want you to have the Lisanne's Diplomacy and with the minimum GPA of 2.5 or 2.8, depending on which course you apply for. And in addition to that, we will ask you to have and IELTS, so that's the International English Language Testing um, Certificate. So that's, uh, we usually would ask for a six for students applying for bachelor's degree and for 6.5 if you're applying for a master's. Uh, we also accept other English qualifications, so Cambridge test, TOEFL, Pearson. If you're studying IB, we can accept that as well. So we ask you for an, a general academic knowledge and then for English as well. And for some other degrees, maybe fashion, design, animation, architecture, graphic design, 
all of these courses that are a bit more creative, you would need to create a portfolio. If you're interested in those courses, you have to scan the QR code here, because that will take you to the, um, to the guide about how to prepare for portfolios for every, every course that requires one. Okay, and that's it. So now I'm gonna take your questions. And if you have any more, uh, just let me know. So I will start uh, from the bottom. So for the, from the first part, uh, question we received. So I see um, you are saying, I'm considering the UK for master's degree. I may get a language course first too. I would like to learn about scholarships more. I want to seize every opportunity to follow my dreams. Okay, well, that's really great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I really hope all the best for you. I hope you manage to, to get in. I'm sure you will if you put the effort in. So um, you want to know more about scholarships. So for master's degrees, Sorry, I will just skip back. So for masters at this moment, we offer our global scholarship. So that's available for all international students. And that gives you 2000 pounds discount on our fees. So our fees usually are 16 and a half thousand pounds. So that's 16 and a half thousand pounds for undergraduate or postgraduate courses. But please double check the, the, the price when you're applying for postgraduate course because they slightly differ from course to course, from course to course. But on average, this will be 16 and a half thousand. So you would be able to get a 2000 pounds discount. So that would be 14 and a half thousand. And that's automatic. So if you meet the requirements, you will be able to get it. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, let me just find the, the other question. Okay, could you please share the live ex uh, expenses approximately for a student monthly? Okay, yes. So I will just go back to that slide as well in case um, you want to have a look again. So this is the, um, the living expenses for Newcastle. It, it might be slightly different if you study somewhere else. And of course it depends a bit more um, on your lifestyle, what kind of, um, how much you spend on food or how much, um, you know, you go out and things like that. But on average, and that's just an estimate, but on average, if you're not living in London, you're expected to spend around a thousand pounds per month. That's including your accommodation. So, but it could be 800 if you're living in a city like Newcastle where accommodation is cheaper. And maybe if you're, you know, budgeting and you know and maybe cooking more than you know going to restaurants so it could be um between 800 to a thousand i'd say per month with including including rent thank you for the question okay and the next question is could you please let us know more about the tuition fees can you share a link uh yes of course just one moment So you can find um, the tuition fees in that link that I just shared. So usually the tuition fees are 16 and a half thousand, but that's at Northumbria. You'll see that maybe it's a bit different than other universities. So please check with every university individually because it's not going to be the same with everyone. What's at Northumbria, it's 16,000 and a half per year in pounds, uh, but we do have scholarships that make it cheaper. So 3,000 pounds discount for undergraduate, so that's 13 and a half thousand per year, and then 14 and a half thousand for um, postgraduate. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so the next question is, does Northumbria give unconditional offers? So yes, yes we do. So if you meet our entry requirements, which you can see here on the screen, so you have to have um, the required GPA, so that's 3.5 and or 2.5 or 2.8 for a master's degree. So if you have that and you have a required level of English, then we would give you an unconditional offer. So what would happen usually is that students would apply and without having their qualification first. 
but that's completely normal because you have to apply in January before you begin your course in September. So that's half a year before uh, you start that you apply. So if you are a high school student who's in their last year of school, you will only get your certificate in summer, but you have to apply in January. So you will apply before you have the, the certificates. So that's when we would give you a conditional offer. So that would mean that if you get this and this grade in your high school diploma, we will accept you. So that would be a conditional offer. But then you would send us your certificate. We would see that you meet the requirements. And if you do, we will give you an unconditional offer. So yes, definitely we do, we do give unconditional offers if you meet the requirements. Okay, so the next one is, are we, are we able to work after the graduation and do you help with that? So yes, definitely, you are definitely able to work after graduation. So the UK government introduced the graduate root visa, graduate, graduate root visa. So if you Google that, you'll see that it gives you, um, with, with that visa, you can work up to two years uh, as an international student um, in the UK and you will have unlimited like the, the hours will be uncapped so you can work as many hours you can work any work or you can even just be looking forward but you can stay in the UK for up to two years and then um, the goal is to find a company that wants to recruit you wants to keep you and then they will be sponsoring your visa if you want to stay for longer after those two years so that's why it's very important to make those connections during your university years, make um, an effort to, um, to take the opportunities that are offered on your course. So as I mentioned, you will have industry links within your course. So real companies would come in and talk to you uh, during your course. So if you make connections and if you go on a placement here where you work um, during your studies, you make those connections and maybe the one of those companies which is really likely they would hire you after your studies and they would be able to help you with your visa after those two years of graduate visa finish so it's definitely able possible to work after graduation and we do offer help with that as well so if you need to um, get a job after work after studies or get a visa uh, we have a service student support and well-being and careers and employability service that can help you with those things Okay, and we have one more question. So if you have any more questions, just put them in the questions box and I will answer. Um, it looks like the last one is about IB requirements. So is the IB requirement to get admission into Northumbria University much higher than the university requirement of universities in the UK? So um, no, I don't think it's higher. I think it's um, average. Actually, so we would ask for 28 points in IB. So 28 points in IB with three high level subjects at grade four or above. So 28 points with three high level subjects at grade four or above. For some courses like architecture, we would ask you to have 30 IB points um, and three high level subjects at four or above. And for some degrees like architect, sorry, like um, engineering or sport and exercise science or chemist chemistry, biology, we would also have special subject requirements. So for chemistry, you have to have chemistry at high level, for biology, biology, for engineering, you need maths, sport and exercise science needs you to have biology as well. So in those cases, we would also ask you to have a higher level in that subject with grade five. We can also accept uh, your English grade from IB as well. So you don't, if, if you're taking IB, you don't have to take IELTS because we can accept higher level or standard level of IB as, as, as a proof of your English knowledge. Yes, so that's it. Um, do you have any more questions? I will just go to my last slide as you type up your last questions, if you have any. But if you don't, uh, then I thank you a lot for your time. I hope this was useful and helped you understand which myths about studying in the UK are true and which are false. 
I hope you got some clarity and answers and I hope you're feeling a bit more sure about studying in the UK. Um, if you do have any more questions or and if you don't want to ask during the session, you can email me. You can see my email on the screen. And you can also book an online meeting with me. So that's just a casual one-to-one -one chat, just about anything you wish to talk about. You just have to scan the QR code and find a time that works for you. And uh, I'll be in touch. So if there's no more questions, then I thank you for your time. I hope this was useful. And I wish you a good evening. Yes, thank you very much for the great presentation, Lina. It was a very informative session for the attendees. And I would like to thank the participants in Turkish as well. Katıldığınız için teşekkür ederiz arkadaşlar. Umarım sizin için de faydalı bir webinar olmuştur. Uh, Northern Bray University ile ilgili diğer sorularınız için uh, Lina'ya ekrandaki mail adresinden ulaşabilirsiniz. Uh, bir sonraki webinarlarımızda görüşmek üzere. Thank you very much again, Lina. It was a pleasure to have you in IFT Talks. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.